So how many of you have uh, had a creme brulee here at camp? Uh-huh. See, that's the problem. Um, we in the past have had some uh, graciously made uh, creme brulees, but the problem has been throughput. Um, so we, are, I think, are attempting to remedy that. And uh, we've got Taylor and Jacob up here about to talk about let them eat creme brulee. So please wel welcome them to the camp stage. Thank you, thank you. Um, so as Gio mentioned, uh, I'm Taylor. This is Jacob. Uh, we're f we work for Great Scott Gadgets. Um, and we are going to attempt to uh, make our slides work. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. We're going to attempt to make uh, 700 creme brulees here this week uh, and weekend and uh, make sure that everybody gets one. Um, so this, this attempt would not be possible without some great people. Uh, we want to thank the, the whole Great Scott Gadgets crew, uh, Mike and Dominic, Elizabeth, Lisa, Steve, Matt. Um, they've helped us through all of this, getting everything built, designed, and uh, getting up here today. Uh, also, Kate Temkin helps write some great, great FET code. Um, Koss and Rebecca helped get some stuff here, which makes it very possible for us to do this. Um, and all of Tour Camp uh, for giving us this opportunity and uh, helping us helping us achieve it, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm sure most of you know what creme brulee is. It's a, uh, but if you don't, it's a custard with a caramelized sugar on the surface of it. Um, Lovely dessert. Um, the origins of creme brulee are, are claimed by quite a few different countries. The French, the Spanish, and the English, or well, the Catalans and the English, all claim uh, to have created creme brulee. They all call it various things. Uh, but the very first uh, recipe uh, appears in a cookbook in 1691. And then it kind of disappears. It's around for a little while, and it kind of disappears for a while. Um, there are a few exceptions. The uh -oh. too the, far. Yeah, too far. The uh, Trinity College, which is part of Cambridge University, has been serving it continuously to students since the late 1800s. And one of the cool things that they did was they took an iron brand and actually branded their insignia into the into the caramelized sugar, um, which we've tried to imitate in different ways, but uh, with various, various success. Um, and then it just disappears again until the, the opulent 80s. Um, the, all of a sudden, you know, kind of, I've, I've made creme brulee in many different ways and many different times, and you just kind of thought it was a dessert that's been around. It, it just disappeared. And in the 80s, somewhere it pops up, and it caught fire, and it spread everywhere. And now it's in restaurants, it's in grocery stores, it's, you know, people make it at home. Um, the, the biggest advance has been in flavors. Uh, the original recipe was just a plain custard, but vanilla quickly became the, the, main, uh, the main flavor added. Uh, you got other flavors that people add, strawberry, apricot, espresso, chocolate, matcha green tea, pumpkin, pumpkin spice latte. No, we won't do that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then we've decided to do this in a sous vide process. Uh, the sous vide process is, uh, sous vide stands for under vacuum, and it's a method of cooking that involves sealing food, usually involves sealing food in uh, vacuum sealed bags and then cooking it underwater um, and, and very temperature controlled water. Um, the invention of sous vide was, has been claimed by three different people. Uh, the earliest, the earliest claim is uh, in, the, in the late 60s by Colonel McGuckin. Uh, he, was in, he, he was a retired colonel. He got hired by, the, uh, by a hospital in South Carolina to improve the quality of food in the hospital and hopefully to sell that to other institutions. Uh, and then he, he actually started vacuum sealing food, cooking it underwater, and it sealed it. It, it made it everything taste better from that institutional standpoint. It also made it uh, last a lot longer um, without, without additives, without putting chemical preservatives in it, uh, which obviously helped out in institutions. 
Uh, and then there were two Frenchmen that also claimed to have created the method, and they eventually began working together, and that's where we get the name sous vide. Um, and then, a brief history of creme brulee at tour camp. <laughs> it all started eight or nine years ago at Torcon. Uh, there was a group of people that wanted to go out and eat in a restaurant, and uh, a young or younger Mike Osman decided to tag along. Uh, they all jumped in a van and headed many miles north of San Diego to a restaurant that claimed to have the best creme brulee on the planet. They, they went through the meal, they got creme brulee, and shortly afterwards, uh, that, that same Mike Osman popped up and, and proclaimed, that was good, but I make the best creme brulee on the planet. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shortly after that, the concept of Crimber Lake Con was uh, formed, and after the prerequisite <coughs> con hangover, it was abandoned. Um, <laughs> a few years later, at, at uh, Tour Camp 2014, Mike's infamous claim was called. Some ingredients were, were procured, and a small batch was made. The crim part went well. The brulee part, not as well. He tried to brulee it with a hot air rework station. <laughs> um, Fast forward again to 2016, Tour Camp 2016, and there was a, a, a better attempt made. About 10 to 20 were made, and, and uh, there was a torch available this time, which, which helped things out. But uh, promises were made and, and not kept, and people were shunned. <laughs> uh, the, the shunning of people led to a, uh, an elitist hierarchy around creme brulee. And, and <laughs> Um, elitist hierarchies are made to be toppled. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand before you today to proclaim, no more, no more shall creme brulee be used as a status symbol. <laughs> the lucky few who want to return to a, feudal, a custard-based feudalism, this will not happen. That is why we've created Creme Brulee Camp, where custard flows like wine, and everyone shall get their just desserts. <laughs> so yeah, there's probably an easier way to do this, but there's no fun in that. Dominic Spill, 2018. <laughs> so the problem is, how do we make roughly 700 jars of Creme Brulee while we're at camp? Uh, the custard needs to be cooked pretty slowly and at a very even temperature. Uh, for this reason, when custard's cooked in an oven, um, it's in a water bath. Mike and Gio found a creme brulee method for a countertop sous vide cooker. Um, on this website, information was given about using jars in a canning method uh, as opposed to vacuum sealing bags, which would work out a lot better when you go to brulee the sugar on top of the jars. They, uh, they tried it out. It was pretty good. It was very good. It was also pretty easy. It, uh, it only took a little bit of discussion to realize that it would also scale well. Uh, the recipe was simple. The, uh, it was scalable. And creme brulee's cooked in jars were fully submerged so you could utilize the entire expansive uh, space inside of your luggage. Uh, so obviously, we needed to make our own version of this. Uh, how, how do we get to that? Um, the first step in designing a system is you kind of need to know what you're designing for. Um, once we realized that we were going to be making well over 500 servings, uh, we kind of had to start figuring out how to make large batches. Um, well, we also needed to figure out what the size of those servings would be. We, we ended up, we started looking for available jar sizes. We ended up going with a four ounce jar size, which was the one on the last slide, um, figured that was a good, it wasn't you know, a single bite, but it was good enough that, that everybody would get a good taste and wouldn't be wasting too much. We could make a lot in one batch. Um, then, then we had to figure out how we're going to heat the water. They, they, make con they make countertop sous vide stations, but they're not very large. They make sous vide sticks, but they're kind of overly pricey. And there are industrial sous vide cookers, but they're large and pricey and hard to get to tour camp. Um, so we're going to go ahead and make our own. Um, so what do we do? We heat the water. 
we, um, we, we, we decided we didn't have to reinvent the wheel, but we're going to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we also needed to know the recipe. Um, the recipe uses four simple ingredients, cream, sugar, egg yolks, and vanilla. Uh, that's pretty easy, but it, all the creme brulee that I've ever made in the past, you have to take all the egg yolks, you temper them, you, or sorry, you cream them first, so you whip a bunch of sugar into them, get some air into them. It's time consuming, it's arm consuming, it's kind of a pain. Then you have to temper cream into a hot boiling cream into it without cooking the eggs. Again, very time consuming. What the recipe that they found online didn't call for creaming the eggs, didn't call for tempering, it called for this nice slow mixing of these ingredients and the test cooks were great. So, all right, perfect. We've got an easy recipe that's not as time consuming. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it turns out uh, jamming a whisk into the end of a drill and going to town on the custard isn't a good way to make it. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you end up with a few more air bubbles than you would like. So uh, we just mixed it by hand. <laughs> so now that we've got the custard, how do we get it into the jars? We looked at a bunch of different fill methods. We looked at uh, mechanizing a pour spout with a servo and then taking that mechanized pour spout and using different things like an ultrasonic sensor um, to get fill level, all right, shuts down the servo when it gets to a certain height, or we weigh out what we want, we put limit switches on a balance or on a scale, shuts down when it hits the weight. Uh, we even looked at shooting, optical, or shooting light to an optical sensor through the jar, and when that hits level, it shuts off. Um, we looked at a lot of these things, we played around with some stuff, and you know, it really, it turns out that the best way for us to get custard into a jar is to give an intern a pitcher. <laughs> um, so the first iteration that we came up with involves a series of buckets. Um, we, we found some bucket heaters online. They were cheap. They, they worked really well. Uh, so we decided, all right, let's heat up water in one bucket. We'll pump it to another bucket when it's time, or we'll circulate it between buckets so we have the correct volume of water. When it's time, when it's up to temperature, we'll introduce a third bucket, circulate the water into that. That won't drop the temperature too much, uh, and, and we can do the cook just in a bucket. The problem was buckets lose heat like crazy, um, and we could only do about 35 at a time. We did look at doing multiple buckets. You could scale the amount of buckets, but we were still losing heat very quickly, and it was hard to keep it even up at temperature. Um, so yeah, after that, it was time for a better option than buckets. We came up with coolers. Yeah. So we got a cooler. We'll heavily modify a cooler. And, and we should say that there are cooler, th this isn't, necessarily our initial idea. We redesigned the way we wanted to do it, but we, uh, there's definitely been people that have made sous vide, uh, sous -vide systems and coolers before. There's a, there's a Hackaday uh, page about it. and it, They're good systems, but we wanted to spin our own, and so we started modifying a cooler. Um, the bucket heaters worked great, even though the buckets didn't, so we wanted to continue with the bucket heaters. Uh, they obviously didn't fit into the cooler, so we had to modify one side, and we quickly realized as we were trying to check temperature and things as we opened, okay, well, now we've got to cut the cooler lid in half or in, in pieces, and uh, now we've got a good setup. All right, so the bucket heaters stay. We can get, to, we can get access in. Um, and initially, we tried heating the water. We tried checking temperature, and we quickly realized that if we weren't circulating the water, the water was definitely much hotter on one side than it was on the other, and it didn't make sense to move bucket heaters, let's move water. So we started introducing some of the pumps that we had used before. <coughs> that worked great. Um, all right, so we've got a good cooler going. Now, how do we get the 
jars of custard in and out of the cooler. You know, we looked at, okay, we could just cycle the water in and out of the cooler. That didn't make sense. Then we'd have to modify multiple coolers. We couldn't scale it as easily. Um, we tried sticking our hands in the hot, well, we tried sticking the intern's hands in the hot water. <laughs> that didn't work well either. Um, need a new intern. Anybody? <laughs> um, so then we came up with the kind of concept that if we used a basket, um, if we used a basket, it would make it easy enough to drop a bunch of custard in at once, take it out, bring it to a different place to cool. We could also vary the size. If, if we say we make 100, we make, we make a full cooler worth first, but then we've got a bunch of custard around and we don't have enough people that want to eat the custard yet, well, we could do two baskets, one basket, that kind of thing, or we could cook our lunch in there at the same time if we do a different basket. And, um, we tried looking for any old basket. We thought fryer baskets, that might work, but it turns out coolers and fryers don't tend to be the same size, so we need to go ahead and make our own baskets. Uh, we went through a couple designs. I won't bore you with creating a box because you've all folded a box before. So we, we created a few designs. We came up with ones that worked. And we also found that uh, expanded aluminum worked really well. It doesn't oxidize very easily. It, it's uh, malleable so that when they don't fit, we can kind of smash them in there. Um, and we happen to have some on hand, so that helped as well. Uh, so, so great, we've got the baskets. We need to get them in and out now. Um, so yeah, reaching into a cooler full of nearly boiling hot water kind of sucks. Um, so we thought of ways to make that suck less. And one of the ways, well, the way that we decided on was bend some metal rods into a hook fashion and pull the baskets up uh, out of the uh, hot coolers. But uh, we didn't want to stop there. So uh, we happen to have a 3D printer back at the lab. and. Uh, decided to print some nice little handles for it, because why not? Um, two of the three handles are made out of a green uh, PLA filament. Um, a GSG green. Yeah, GSG green. <laughs> um, the third handle, two out, yeah, the third out of three handles, which I'll get to in a minute, is made out of a white PCTPE flex. Um, the idea here is that, you know, while we had some nice green handles, we wanted to raise the bar in 3D printer handle comfort. Um, and so this material would ideally make for a squishier handle, making it nicer for us to pick these baskets up out of the cooler. Um, unfortunately, our handle design was too rigid, and it just ended up being just as hard as the green stuff, but it was worth a shot. Um, so why do we only have three handles, not four? Oh, well, uh, I kind of suck at 3D printing. Um, <laughs> at least with a uh, dual extruder head, which is what we started experimenting with leading up to tour camp. Um, so what you see here is kind of a graveyard of lost handles. Um, just a moment of silence <laughs> for their loss. Um, but we ended up with a nice purple flower pot with green filament <laughs> flowers. So you know, not all was lost there. Um, so why did this start happening? I have a bit of a theory. Uh, so dual extruder printing, how it works is you have two print nozzles. One nozzle prints the material for the actual handle, and the other nozzle prints the support structure to kind of hold the object up while it's printing. And this support structure can be broken off or washed off after the print is done. And so one nozzle will turn on and heat up and print a layer, and then turn off and cool down, while the other nozzle heats up and prints its layer. And I think the problem is arising, and if anyone actually knows a solution to this, definitely let me know, because I haven't figured it out. Um, the second support structure nozzle wasn't cooling down enough, and so we were just getting drippage while nozzle one was printing, and ending up with kind of a double print, and ultimately it was interfering with the handle, and all kinds of bad things started happening. Um, the printer isn't smart enough to know that that's happening, so it just kind of keeps going on its merry way until it thinks it's done, um, at which point all hell kind of breaks loose and you end up with flower pots and all kinds of crazy stuff. Especially if you're not paying attention to the 3D printer and you're yeah. in another room and <laughs> come back to a nice globular mess. 
Right. So yeah, if anyone knows how to fix that, definitely let me know. Um, All right, now that we have the proper cook vessel, we've got jars, we've got baskets, we've got comfortable handles, well, three out of four of our comfortable handles, um, and a method for filling the jars, uh, we're, we're ready to cook. Uh, we did want to do some automation of it, and, and uh, how we decided we were going to automate is with the great fat. So yeah, time for a shameless product plug. <laughs> great fit is a next generation good fit. <laughs> Reading off our website. Uh, it's a next generation good fit intended to serve as your custom high speed USB peripheral through the addition of expansion boards called neighbors. Um, so all that's good and fine, but what does that have to do with cooking creme brulee? Well, cooking 700 jars of creme brulee, as you might imagine, might be kind of time consuming and kind of gets in the way of drinking at camp. So uh, in the name of drinking on the job, we decided to automate our cook process using GreatFet. Um, so we attached our two bucket heaters to GPIO pins, as well as a temperature sensor and a nice little LCD screen so that we can easily look at it and see what it's doing, if it's cooking, if it's cooling down, if it's done, how much time's elapsed, things like that. Um, now that we have all this nice hardware hooked up, we kind of quickly realized that we actually needed to write some code to make any of this do anything useful or maybe even cook some creme brulee for us. So we have all the ingredients, a great fit, a temperature sensor, um, bucket heaters, a nice little screen. And so the cook process itself is pretty simple. You turn on the board and it turns on the sensors and the heaters for you and it continuously heats up until we reach about 80 degrees Celsius, at which point we move from the heating up phase into the cooking phase, at which point a timer is started and the heaters are turned off and we stay in the cooking phase until temperature drops below a threshold, at which point we move back into heating up and basically this cycle continues until the timer is done and ideally our creme brulee is cooked. Um, so while the design's fairly simple, um, it was kind of a lot to take on <coughs> as someone who had never really written a lot of embedded C code before. Uh, <laughs> so I did what any great uh, programmer would do and started writing some Python, because why not? <laughs> um, luckily for me, the great fit can uh, run Python code, so double win there. Um, so yeah, after writing up the script based on the cook design and getting all that working. We tested it out and ran a test cook with it and it worked pretty well. Um, just needed to tweak some numbers here and there, but overall it was a pretty nice system. Um, after that I moved on to the fun embedded C code version of the Python project, which wasn't too bad. Um, but if anyone's interested in that code or how to program terribly, all of this codes on the GSG GitHub. Um, so now that we have our automated system, we can spend less time staring at a cooler full of custard and more time drinking at camp. <laughs> All right, so we now have working hard, well, theoretically working hardware and software, and uh, now, now it's time to get to the meat of it and actually see if any of it works. Um, so Jacob mentioned that we have the bucket heaters hooked up to the great fet. We actually have these two off-the-shelf relays hooked up to the great fet, and uh, they're just switching the bucket heaters on and off once they, once they hit threshold, switch them on and off. Uh, and the reason why I kind of want to show this is like, other than the great fet, which is going to be available soon, uh, everything that we used is off the shelf. We didn't want to actually design any hardware. We wanted to like piece everything together, do stuff off the breadboard, and just kind of see what we came up with, see how we could make it work, and see how repeatable it was. And hopefully, anybody else could do the same thing. That, that was the goal. Um, we ended up doing two and a half test cooks. Um, the first one was at our Christmas party. Um, it went mostly well, except for we ended up having too much Christmas party and not enough custard, and uh, 
had to come back and try that test cook again another day. Um, but we, we did get it all done. That, that We did actually make 35 creme brulees in the buckets, but as I mentioned before, you know, we, we lost a lot of heat. We decided we couldn't scale it. So, all right, then we went back, redesigned, got everything back in working order again. Then we did our next test cook in the cooler. Um, the, the cooler went well. Um, so yeah, um, the cooler test, some things that we found is it turns out that dropping 120 cold jars of custard into 10 gallons of hot water drops the temperature pretty significantly, and go figure. Um, and that could have an effect on the outcome of the cook. So we tweaked the code a little bit to heat up more on the initial ramp up before dropping jars in and then maintaining the 80 degrees over the duration of the cook, which turned out pretty well. Um, and the heaters, yeah, we mentioned before, the pumps are pretty crucial because the bucket heaters are really good at heating water, but water is right next to it, right? So pumping the water around ensures that we have a more even and consistent temperature at each jar throughout the entire cooler, so you end up with more delicious custard. Uh, and we had done we had done that test cook um, once with the Python code, and then we did it another, I, I, I mentioned two and a half test cooks. We did several half test cooks where we didn't cook any custard, but we, once we got the embedded code working, we ran through a bunch of tests with the embedded code and just water and seeing what happens and seeing how we could alter the, the temperature of the water to make sure our code kept up, and it all worked well. Um, one thing I didn't mention before is creme brulee, you have to cook it, but then you have to cool it. If you don't cool the creme brulee and you try to brulee it, once, as soon as you put the sugar on, the sugar starts to melt. It, it turns into a runny mess. Uh, it, it just, you'll, you don't get that nice brulee on top. Um, and cooling in the past, especially with the temps that have been made here at Tour Camp, uh, cooling has taken hours. Uh, you either have to let it settle at the room temperature and then put it in the fridge or slam it right in the fridge. And, and, and it's still, even if you do that, it takes hours. Um, but it turns out through, through nice scientific research that if you put a vessel into ice water, not ice, not water, but ice water, uh, that vessel cools in around seven minutes. Um, uh, we assume this from custard, but I've always known that with beer. Um, and it works well with beer. Um, so time to test that out. We had done, we'd done a full cook of 120 jars. Um, throw it in a cooler full of ice, sure enough. Seven minutes, they were all cold, they were all ready to go. Um, so we ended up with this. We ended up with two coolers. We have one for cooking, one for cooling. We have two bucket heaters, a pump. We ended up with several pumps, but we killed a few of them in the process, but you know, that'll happen with pumps. Uh, six nice artisanal aluminum baskets, two relay switches, a temperature sensor, an LCD screen, a great fat one with a, a LiPo uh, battery neighbor and uh, a solderless breadboard neighbor. Uh, piece all that together, we have our system. Now it's time for brulee. Brulee, yeah, as you can see there, we did brand our logo in, into, uh, into a brulee at one point. Uh, it looks nice, it doesn't go well on a slide or it doesn't transfer well to a slide so much, but it's there. Um, uh, and m there are several brulee methods. The, the, essentially, the original one was you can cook off discs in an oven of, of sugar and then just drop them on top of a custard. Uh, the other thing you can do is put them under a broiler, cook that. You risk curdling the custard at that point. And the most common method is just a handheld torch. It's the method we're going to use here. But we also, you know, this is a common handheld torch. It doesn't take long. It's, it's quick. It, and it, it works well. We, we, however, can't just leave good enough alone. Uh, we wanted to try to figure out several ways to, to make the brulee, brulee more exciting. Um, so we tried a few methods. <laughs> so we have a 100-watt laser sword uh, at the lab. <laughs> Um, we thought, hey, uh, we've always talked about what we could cook in the, with a laser, uh, why not? And um, all right, this is a perfect opportunity to try to cook something. Um, 
we we go ahead we went ahead and at full power uh brulee some sugar on top which is both of these videos are at full power and and jacob created this this spiral pattern that went well and uh full power that's great uh it all it takes a little less than a minute and if we were to go ahead and cut a jig that would fit into it we could you know scale that pretty well um However, we didn't want to break down our entire 100 watt laser cutter and bring it to camp, um, considering we moved it across town once and, and broke the broke the the uh, laser. Um, and yeah, pretty big. Yeah. Um, so, what are some other options for laser? Well, we started looking around and we found that you could buy five watt and ten watt ten watt laser pointers, and thought, oh. Ooh. Maybe we could make a little CNC machine to do this with a laser pointer or even hand out laser pointers at this uh, nice, somewhat legal power rating. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. The couple issues there, obviously we didn't want anyone to lose their eyesight while they're here at camp. Um, but it also takes around 40 minutes to brulee uh, sugar at <laughs> five watts. We tested that on the laser cutter at five percent power, um, and yeah, just way too long. And size also was obviously an issue. Like this thing, is pretty massive. Um, so yeah, we uh, moved on to a third option, which involved torches, but they were uh, much bigger torch. A little bigger. <laughs> um, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> You know, what could go wrong? You've got a nice big torch, you hopefully just pass it by and it's gonna brulee, you've, you've got some BTU there, it's good, all right. Um, well, so, boom. Um, we had a large failure rate with this. There's, there, we lost for every, I'd say, 15 custards that we tried, we lost at least three jars. Uh, so that's not gonna scale very well. Uh, every jar that we lost also, shot glass into the adjacent jars. <laughs> a little less delicious. Um, and, and there's, couldn't get a good video of it, but there's like little volcanoes of custard every once in a while. Like custard, a hot custard comes shooting out. Um, yeah, it, it curdled the custard, it cooked it, it turned it to scrambled eggs. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, yeah, and with all of the methods, we broke glass, every single method. Even just the handheld torch, we uh, left it too long in one spot and shattered one of the jars. Obviously, the, the uh, big torch took a lot of jars out. And even the laser cutter, we had, it just, we had one jar just slightly offset. And as the spiral came around, it, it started hitting the jar. It actually shaved a little piece of glass off in the jar, of the jar, and you can see the spiral <laughs> cut as it goes by. It shaved a piece off, and it landed right, you know, right in the brulee. So, you know, we got good at breaking glass. Um, hey, that extra crunch. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. A little sprinkle uh, on there. So yeah. So the moment you thought you were waiting for. We're not actually serving creme brulee right here. <laughs> we are going to serve creme brulee. The rest of the the rest of camp, uh, we're gonna immediately after this talk go back to our cabin. We're gonna start up the cooler. We're gonna have the whole full setup going, so anybody can come by and check out the setup. Uh, it's gonna take us three to three and a half hours from the time we start to get the first batch, but then it'll be every hour, hour and a half that we get another 120 to come out of the cooler. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or at least that's the goal. Um, Hopefully we get another 120 every hour, hour and a half. Um, and then it, it all depends on when they get the next truck full of cream at the local grocery store. We also, do, we also did have a small supply chain problem where the, the grocery store actually lost uh, a good chunk of their dairy delivery, was uh, failed due to temperature, and so they had to send a bunch of stuff back. Uh, so hopefully tomorrow morning they're supposed to get the rest in. We hope to, to have everything done by the end of the day tomorrow. We hope to have at least 700 of them cooked. Uh, so come by, come bring your token, come check out the setup. Uh, we'll brulee it right there for you, hand you a nice fresh, fresh creme brulee. Um, so ultimately what, did, what works for the brulee top? You just, just the handheld the torch. torch, yeah. <laughs> we got, a, yeah, we got about way. 10 propane torches uh, sitting back in the cabin ready to go, so yeah. That was just an exercise in failure.
for the most part. It was, it was great. It was good fun, but yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Do we have the option to get some uh, shredded glass on the top? You, <laughs> it's possible. Or if you sign a waiver, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Oh, the other thing to, to mention, as you notice, this is a badge. This is a fully populated badge in the jar. They are sized to fit in the jar. So if you come get your creme brulee, you can take the jar back. Uh, the kits will be available at the maker stage, or the, the components will be available at the maker stage. You can populate your jar, and then it's a, it's a Firefly uh, kit. Uh, we've hung them around our necks. They don't, they, it's not too heavy. It's nice, and there you go. I mean, after the custard. No custard, but, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it's nice. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming to the talk. <laughs>
as we did those tests, we decided to come back around, all right, let's go ahead and brulee one by hand, stick it back under the laser and see what we get. And that's what the, what the logo ended up looking at, like. Uh, and was that at the low power or the high power? Yeah, that was also low power. That was run. low power. So it, the low power, we, could, we actually did discuss using the low power lasers to do designs instead of bruleeing. Um, and we also decided that would be a little dangerous. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you. <laughs>